My name is David Orban, and I am very glad to have all of you following the show. Before we start, I want to remind you that even if we are live, you can always watch past episodes both on Facebook and on YouTube. And of course, on YouTube, you can also subscribe to the channel. We also have a Discord community, and I invite you to join on davidorban.com slash Discord. And finally, if you are, um, if you find the show valuable, as well as the other content that I produce and the knowledge that I share, you're welcome to become a supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash David Orban. So today's uh, theme is drones, autonomous cars, hyperloops, spaceships maybe. What is the future of transportation? Certainly the invention of the, inter the internal combustion engine has been a very important advancement and it allowed us to travel far and to improve the distribution of our products, to increase the productivity of farms, and in many, many other ways. However, we are also in a real war with cars. Traffic accidents represent the leading cause of death for the younger age brackets in the United States. And worldwide, about a million people die every year of tra traffic accidents. They are polluting our cities and contribute to rapid climate change. Today's guest is an expert on a particular future type of car, the self-driving car. Brett Templeton is a Canadian software developer, internet entrepreneur, online community pioneer, publisher of news, comedy, science fiction, and eBooks, writer, photographer, civil rights advocate, futurist, public speaker, educator, and of course, very importantly for us, self-driving car consultant. He was the founder and CEO in 1989 of Clarinet Communications, which was the first company founded to engage in commercial activity uh, over the early internet, the so-called dot-com company. He was also the chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and is the chair of networks and computing systems at Singularity University. He holds numerous patents in the fields of self-driving cars, and he is uh, a writer uh, for Forbes magazine. So welcome, Brad Templeton. Uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon. And uh, I uh, I apologize, everyone is missing their aperitivo right now, I suppose. Uh, they would be out uh, in, in your town doing this, and uh, we have to take a break from that. But uh, very glad to be with you. And um, one thing that, uh, that uh, we enjoy uh, on uh, searching for the question live is, is to share uh, with uh, with our viewers uh, where uh, we are, where uh, our guests are. So uh, I am uh, not exactly in Milan. I am Bergamo, but uh, uh, Milan is nice too, and it's close enough. So let's let's assume I'm in Milan, and uh, and Brad, you are. Uh, you told me very near to the Apple spaceship, the Apple headquarters uh, in uh, Cupertino. So let's uh, let's go there. There you go on the other side of the world. Uh, have you had the chance of uh, visiting the, the the spaceship here? Uh, only from the outside. They're very uh, uh, secretive about what goes on there. So it's quite walled away from the world. It's the world's largest office building, and any other month but this, it's the world's largest causer of traffic. I think, at least in my neighborhood, <laughs> uh, it, it, they built uh, quite a nice uh, park as well. This was originally belonging to HP, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, to Tandem, which was acquired by HP. Uh, and so they uh, tore down all those buildings and put up both the circular building. You can see the large parking garages, lots of solar power. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, I, people inside tell me it's a very lovely place to work. But it's, it is not something that you easily get to go inside. And, uh, and it is in the heart of Silicon Valley, which extends from San Francisco uh, to um, San Jose, more or less. Mm -hmm. and where um, the largest uh, concentration of uh, technology companies, uh, uh, software, hardware, yeah. um, and of course, uh, the, the, the reason we talk about uh, Silicon Valley is originally this was more Apple or, or charts, uh, but now it is known for uh, giving Apple birth, uh, well, to Apple computers, right? <laughs> 
Uh, uh, not just Apple, so, of course, but Google, uh, Facebook, all, all, almost every company. Well, not Amazon and Microsoft, which are up in uh, Washington State. But, and, uh, and 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 even Microsoft felt the need a few years ago of opening a research center in the Valley because uh, they 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 felt kind of excluded and they felt that uh, they couldn't attract the kind of talent they needed unless they were there. That's right. Well, Silicon Valley is is definitely the world's capital when it comes to technology, and uh, you know there's a little bit of competition from with some areas in China right now. Uh, Silicon Valley has uh, a magic ingredient which many people are not fully aware of, and that is if you get to go to a meeting of Silicon Valley founders and entrepreneurs and executives in this town, uh, you can ask one very important question: Were you born outside the United States? And more than half the room will stand up. Uh, and if you ask if you were born outside Silicon Valley, the rest of the room will stand up. This is a place of immigrants. This is a place where everyone came here going through the hoops that the United States immigration puts people through in order to give up their life somewhere else and come and do something big. That's the actual secret. People say, how is it that Silicon Valley keeps winning? Why is it all of these companies, all this innovation, all this money flowing through here? And it's not because of the people who were here. It's because of the people who came here. Sometimes I'm asked by people, you know, how could we have the Silicon Valley of, uh, of Italia? And I say, oh, no, no problem. You can do it, just not with Italians. Uh, yeah. And they, of course, they, they find that answer very offensive. But I say, you are that much smarter than California. They didn't do it with Californians. So yeah. uh, you, th you think you can do it with Italians? Or can you do it in France with French people? You can't. Uh, and and, and that, is, that is your case, too, because you're a Canadian, right? That's right. No, I, I moved here uh, when I was in my 30s. I, um, I had been here briefly before I got to be the first employee of one of the very early uh, pioneering companies in Silicon Valley called Visicorp, a personal software, which was the first big PC application software company. And I was their first employee. That was a heady experience when I was a teenager. Uh, and I came back uh, to when I brought my company here, even though I had founded it in Canada. Uh, so this is, this is the, the dark secret. And of course, it's not a secret that's easy to duplicate because we have a world that's growing afraid of immigrants, right? Instead of one that is embracing them the way that Silicon Valley did, the way the United States used to. Uh, but instead, we're now afraid. We're locking down borders that we had tried to open. Uh, and of course, the American president is very anti-immigrant. So uh, that's bad for the world of innovation. So um, you, you are in, in lockdown uh, as well as the, the, the rest of California. But mm -hmm. it looks like uh, the the uh, impact of the pandemic, at least for the moment, in California is manageable, contrary to, for example, New York, that went very close to uh, being in 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 a in a state yeah. where the healthcare system wouldn't be able to manage uh, what was happening. And I do, you, uh, you do you believe that is uh, due to how the the governor uh, the the, uh, the governor um, managed things, for example. And you have my sympathies because I know you split your time between northern Italy and New York. And these are two places which have gone through horror. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can literally breathe a little easier here. Uh, and the reason, although I would not necessarily attribute it to the governor, in some ways I would attribute it to the fact that the economy of uh, northern California in particular um, was much more able to do switch to work from home. So we were locked down before the government said lockdown. Uh, Apple, the company we just looked at, it told its employees don't come to the office a week before the government said that should happen. Uh, Google and all these other companies did that. Um, it was already a very, uh, many people say these, these lockdowns are ordered by the government. There was a lot of it happening already before the final orders came in. Actually attribute it to that. And I won't say that they weren't earlier to do it. Um, and this was because the places that got it first were places that actually had a lot of commerce with China and then a lot of commerce with Italy. New York actually did get many of its cases from Italians. People go back yeah. and forth between Italy and uh, um, New York all the time. People go back and forth between China and, uh, of course, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, uh, Seattle, Vancouver. These cities, uh, and to some extent New York as well, but these cities which had a lot of uh, people traveling between uh, uh, Wuhan in particular and other places were the first to get it. Uh, we identified that, we realized the thing that I don't know why everyone else took a long time to realize it, that even though you're only seeing a few cases since we're testing very few people, uh, there's probably a lot more of it here than we realize. And so the time is now to do what you can to stop it from spreading. And sadly, some places in the world weren't as quick at that, and they've paid a terrible price. So um, 
let's uh, jump into uh, the heart of the theme uh, today, uh, the future of transportation, self-driving cars. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us in a, in, a, in a few minutes, where do you think that the, the future of transportation is, is going? Um, things like, <clears throat> is electric necessarily uh, uh, part of this future or even potentially the, the main driver of the future? Are self-driving cars going to um, be here soon or, or, or less um, abruptly, less imminently as, as uh, some of us would believe? And, and what about other kinds of, of transportation, like uh, drones, uh, things that the, the spaceship uh, from, from SpaceX delivering point to point uh, uh, on, on, on Earth uh, rather than interplanetary? Well, so I usually take about two hours to answer that question. I know. Uh, let's, uh, do, let's do five minutes, and then I will do many, many more questions. Yeah, so let's let's delve into specific. Huge, the uh, ground transportation is the third largest industry in the world, about $5 trillion. Um, so we, there's an immense amount of opportunity, an immense amount of change that will happen. Transportation is, in a way, the purpose of cities. Uh, we live in cities because we want to have it be a short trip to everything in our lives, restaurants, friends, not just driving, of course, but walking, all of it. Uh, and the transportation mode defines how the city works. And cities have changed. Uh, in the 20th century, the, uh, the automobile changed the structure of cities. And before that, the tram, the, uh, um, the trolleys and so on changed the structure of cities. And before that, probably the horse. So it's really dramatic. It's really huge. Uh, so, of course, what we've got is several things going on. We have computers and cars getting married, and that puts cars on the Moore's Law curve. Moore's Law, the famous principle defined by Gordon Moore of Intel, where he noticed that computer processors were getting twice as good about every year and a half. That's happened for over 50 years now. It's been slowing down a little bit in recent times, but I mean, if you look at uh, uh, music and so many other companies from all over the world who are trying to, uh, here's a chart of Moore's Law, yeah, we're seeing up here. This chart, by the way, to make it clear to everybody, is done on what's called a log scale. So every line on the up part, the y-axis, is 10 times bigger than the notch below it. Uh, if you were to try to plot this on a real chart, it would just be uh, incomprehensible because it would explode in, in a way you can't. This is coming to transportation. So you start off the wheel when you're on the highway, which is sort of an early stage that people look for. When they can fully do that, they can be taxis. They can come to you, pick you up, take you where you want to go, go off and pick up someone else. So that drives you around. It keeps you safer than themselves, depending on what fuel they have in them. Uh, and that uh, alters a whole bunch of the equation. That, by the way, if the fact that the car actually is in, of course, many people, I have an electric car myself. Many people have electric cars. They're great. Um, they're very fast and high performance, and they're actually pretty cheap to operate. So that's happening already, but that's still only about 1% of the cars. It's taking time to happen. But you don't care about what's under the hood of your taxi. Only the fleet manager cares. And so when we start seeing a lot of people in robotic taxis, then you suddenly see, um, you know, this, this ability to have uh, electric vehicles and new designs of vehicles. Most trips that people, lighter vehicles and vastly reduce the amount of energy for transportation and really reduce the emissions. And that's it's also going to... Uh, Reduce the world seems to like, the Americans seem to like. Uh, it'd be nice to put an end to that as well. Uh, the, the, the list of consequences goes on and on. But by the way, I didn't even mention the first one, the reason everyone got involved. And that was to, um, to save lives because we have about 1.3 million people dying every year in car accidents. And everyone working on this has as their plan to make the vehicles safer than human beings, eventually much like. Um, so... You mentioned Moore's Law, which is the reason that initially uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge, which was a competition organized by uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, failed and then succeeded, right? Probably it was organized on the border of being impossible and then progressively becoming almost inevitable. Uh, 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 Sebastian Trun. Uh, was uh, at, at the head of the team that uh, he became uh, part of uh, the... Uh, thank you very much. And then he became part of Google's um, self-driving car unit, which today uses uh, Chrysler um, models uh, that they modify uh, ever more 
uh, imperceptibly. Uh, they are getting smaller and smaller, as well as the lidars, the the various sensors that uh, perceive the, the world around them. Um, I I uh, met uh, um, a year ago John Elkan, uh, the the head of um, FCA, the owners of uh, Chrysler, mm -hmm. and uh, he was very. Uh, excited about the uh, 60,000 uh, unit uh, order that uh, uh, that uh, is worth uh, billions of dollars that uh, uh, Chrysler received from uh, from uh, from Google, um, and Google actually started a limited uh, service in Pittsburgh for the self-driving cars. No, no, that, that was just outside of Phoenix, not Pittsburgh. Oh, sorry, Phoenix. Uh, thank you for the correction. So. Um, do you think that uh, that Waymo is going to start expanding the service uh, to to other cities? Um, are they resolving the issues that uh, plagued uh, other um, experiments, like, for example, Ubers, that uh, unfortunately had a fatal uh, accident, uh, uh, killing a cyclist? and which uh, very negatively impacted uh, not only their um, experimentation, but also those of others. Well, how do you, how do you see the, the, the progression, the progression uh, of, of the deployment going? Uh, yeah, you put a lot to pack in there. One thing I'll mention is the one man you named there, Sebastian Thrun, uh, of course, also an immigrant to German, uh, did win that DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, did start the uh, Google Chauffeur Project, which became Waymo. I worked. Uh, with him on that project uh, back in its early days, which is where I got some of my earlier experience. Uh, and of course, Sebastian has now declared, as even as the person who brought me into this field, uh, he has declared that he's uh, now thinks it was the wrong direction and now he's in all about flying. So we'll probably get into flying a little bit later because I've been working with some companies in that space too. And, uh, and, and actually, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali from, uh, I think, Pakistan, uh, wants to uh, talk about flying cars too, right? Yeah, so, un un sure. unfortunately, uh, th there is another um, friend who writes with Arabic script completely. So, I don't know what uh, the comment is saying. I hope something very nice. And, well, you know, uh, Moore's, Moore's Law has actually given us tools now that can translate all that in real time for us. Uh, but uh, it's not built into your system yet, but maybe it will be correct, in the future. Correct, correct. Uh, uh, if so we were natively on Facebook, uh, Facebook would offer the translation right away. You're right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, getting back to the uh, Waymo. Uh, yes, they're definitely the leader. Uh, aside from having a really talented and, and great team, they've uh, been at it since the beginning, and they have the almost unlimited resources of the Alphabet Google company. So those are some big advantages to have. Uh, and that's why they have um, indeed uh, ordered a very large fleet from FCA and also why they are the only ones who actually are operating a prototype service uh, in Arizona where cars are actually running around. Not all of them, they still uh, supervise most of them, but a lot of them are actually running around with nobody in them at all and picking up passengers and taking them where they're going with no one else but the passengers in the car. Nobody else has been at the level where they would, would dare to do that. Um, Uber, as you mentioned. Uh, now, Uber is an important company to think about in this space for two reasons. One you mentioned, uh, they've had the worst and most tragic uh, incident in their project. But the important thing to understand is what I said earlier, which is that many people believe that this changes the automotive industry from being about selling cars, which is what your friend uh, at Fiat uh, is uh, used to, uh, to being about selling rides. And we know that Uber has built the number one brand in the world in selling rides. Uh, which is a pretty nice thing to have if you think that's where the world's going to go. And that's indeed why Uber has put that much effort into what they're doing. But they did it very badly. Now, to be, I, I'm not sure this is being fair to them, but to express the truth, that fatality was uh, the tragic result of human error. It wasn't um, really the, when the Transportation Safety Board did their investigation of it. They did not pin the blame on this, uh, the software itself. The software did make mistakes, but it's very important to understand that in the prototype testing phase of any technology like this, it is naturally expected that the software will regularly make mistakes. Uh, and uh, Waymo's software, everyone's software, uh, quite which I have been in Google's car when it uh, then you know did things that would have veered it off the road if I hadn't taken control. That's a 
that's what you expect when you're starting it out. That's why you have people in it who are watching it and supervising the road. Uh, Uber had a car that was very primitive, maybe even more primitive than it should have been, and we can argue that. But the reality is that what happened was one of those failures occurred as they're expected to do so, uh, but they had not trained and hired their supervisor well at all, to say the least, and she was watching a TV show on her phone instead of doing her job. And uh, the result, unfortunately, was hitting a person on the street. Uh, so it did set back the industry, as you say, uh, but in a sense, uh, it really was the fault of Uber uh, and that safety driver in terms of how they built the safety procedures around testing and developing the vehicle. Everybody else uh, has a very good safety record. And at Waymo, uh, I liken it to the teenagers that we have on the road. Teenagers are also not very good drivers and they're pretty reckless. Uh, but they go out with driving instructors uh, who are watching them and can grab the wheel and hit the brakes. And uh, we allow that, um, and we turn them into better drivers, and eventually they become safer drivers after decades of driving, actually. The teenagers, after we license them, are still a problem. And this is how the self-driving cars are also being tested and trained, with people watching over them and everyone w working towards the day when we can get them off their learner's permit and onto the street. A very important company to talk about, of course, is also Tesla because they have uh, um, a, a native uh, EV fleet and uh, they claim uh, to be going rapidly towards uh, uh, full self-driving capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, already they have uh, uh, what they call autopilot where you can um, give over uh, functions uh, to the car uh, in a limited sense, while keeping your eye on the road and your hands on the wheel. Uh, and um, they uh, built uh, all the hardware and software in a vertical integration approach that seems to be uh, what uh, what uh, many uh, of, of uh, these, uh, these companies are attempting, uh, as well as, uh, as you illustrated in one of your articles for, for Forbes, they are promising uh, a, a network for robo taxi service, which would, if their numbers hold up, transform the ownership of a Tesla car uh, from being an ever depreciating asset to being uh, a cash producing uh, asset uh, over the course of, of each year. So, um, uh, what do you believe uh, when when reality hits their plans, uh, the net result is going to be? Yes, well, uh, yes, you used a lot of, um, of phrases like promising and uh, claim, uh, because that's certainly the case here with Tesla. I mean, te so listen, the Tesla car is a great car. Uh, uh, just uh, 10 feet away from us right now is my Tesla. Uh, so that's... Um, uh, in terms of the electric vehicle to, and vehicle to drive, it's it's fantastic, and the company is very different from other car companies. It thinks differently, and that's why it's made uh, an interesting car of the future when you just talk about a plain car. Now, when it comes to self-driving technology, Tesla uh, took an approach, which was to say they were building this car and they were equipping it with a variety of sensors to do their autopilot function. So the autopilot function is not a self-driving tool. Um, it is a tool which does do a very fancy cruise control, basically, and you have to be watching the road and you have to be getting ready to grab the wheel at any time when you drive it. Uh, but they've done a decent job of it, and so it does make driving more relaxing and people like it. Uh, and uh, they built that by using cameras and radars and a few other sensors in the vehicle and the computer that they put in the vehicle. And uh, they hope that they can then put new software, and they've also upgraded the computer, uh, that's the only hardware change they've made. Uh, they hope that they can make a self-driving car on top of that hardware. Now, everybody else who's trying to do this thinks they're nuts in terms of trying to do it with the more limited hardware. They are not using the, admittedly, fairly expensive uh, laser sensors that everyone else you know, likes to use. Um, they are... Um, uh, not. They have not done a bunch of other things with their cameras and so on. And they make very ambitious claims. They have an advantage that they have a deployed... A network of cars out there, which they don't, it's not their fleet in a sense, it belongs to their customers. Um, and that fleet is going out there and is helping them improve their system all the time with the data to get reported back. Although it certainly doesn't report 
all the data back. When Waymo sends cars out to drive and, and uh, Cruise and Zooks and all the other companies that are testing with their own fleets that they own, all the data that's learned comes back, not just a tiny subset of it. However, Tesla's made basically a bet. Their bet is that they can make this happen with the more limited hardware and with some AI neural network techniques that uh, many people, all everyone else uses these techniques too. But they believe we can possibly make this happen with just this. And then if we do, well, we're in a great position. We're going to have, um, you know, we're a car company with a good technology and we'll be able to rule the day. And then yes, further than that, they go and say, our customers will be able to hire their cars out uh, as taxis when they're not using them and that this could make it much more economical to uh, use a car. You had a quick question you want to mention. Well, it looks like they are going beyond that because in many countries, um, uh, the, the the leasing agreements that you can sign uh, if you don't want to buy the car uh, with cash, uh, stop yeah, so the containing an option to buy the car at the end. You are forced to return the car to Tesla, which would imply that they believe that by the time your leasing agreement runs out, typically in four years, mm -hmm. they will want to drive your car rather than letting you have it. Well, so what it says is that they have the option to take the car back, uh, but they are not exercising that option currently. Uh, and uh, But if they decide that those cars are more valuable to them, then they can exercise that option. They can take the cars. And that's a very clever plan. Uh, I will agree that, it, that should it work, uh, that that would be a great plan. Uh, I uh, So I'll, we, we really have a lot to examine here. First of all, can they do it? Uh, so they're taking it, making a bet. And if the bet pays off and the AI technology uh, advances to a breakthrough that no one yet has, then maybe they can do it. Uh, otherwise, they can't do it, most people think. Most people think that they are uh, either, either there they're are fans who say they're in first place and most other people would say they're in last place because they're not doing some things that everyone else considers very important. But if the bet pays off and they do nudge their way up to a leading position, uh, then the question becomes, do taxi fleets operate by using either off-lease cars, which does make sense, or the cars of private owners? And I've uh, been going back and forth. I was probably one of the first people in the world to talk about that model uh, as, as a way that self-driving taxi fleets might arise. But over time, I've actually... Um, come to not believe it as much as when I originally wrote it. And I thought that because I looked at the Airbnbs that people stay in, and I noticed Airbnb switched from being a privately owned house or apartment that you rented out to people when you weren't using it, to being dedicated buildings which are nothing but Airbnb all day. Uh, and so it strikes me that it's quite possible that borrowing someone else's car, except when uh, the load is very high and they've run out of fleet cars and so, okay, we've got like when there's an Uber surge, for example, when there's more people wanting rides than there are vehicles to give the rides, um, what you can do is uh, pull up, you know, Uber does the surge in order to get more drivers to bring cars in the system. You might see the same sort of thing happen where there are fleets of taxis that run around all day. And then at the very peak demand periods, uh, those cars that want to come in and offer rides could come in and offer rides and, and make some money from it. But whether that would be the primary business uh, for a car seems a little less likely. Now, um, Elon Musk so much doesn't believe in flying cars that he actually created a new company digging down rather than betting on, on flying cars, right? Uh, uh, the boring company is uh, uh, improving the eff efficiency of uh, uh, digging tunnels, um, which is also a 3D opportunity. Uh, um, the volume we have available on the ground is plenty. And he says, I'd rather not have uh, heavy things uh, uh, falling on my head. Uh, but as you said, uh, smart people like uh, Sebastian Thron, who founded uh, Kitty Hawk, is is instead uh, betting on on uh, these um, uh, these flying uh, things being possible. So what what do you think about that? Well, so they're both right. Um, yes, you know if you're on the ground, you'd prefer to have people zipping by underground than flying over you. Uh, but uh, the boring company that Elon Musk has founded is based on the idea that he can make tunneling dramatically less expensive than it is today. 
And in part, that's because he just wants to make the tunnel smaller. So if the tunnel is uh, smaller, it turns out the amount of dirt you have to dig out of a tunnel is the square of how wide it is. So you make the tunnel one-fourth the size, you take out one-sixteenth of the ground in order to tunnel it. So you can definitely uh, make the cost of tunneling much less if you can do it um, at a smaller scale. and put a smaller. Not, you're not trying to put two subway tracks down the tunnel. You're trying to put two paths for smaller cars. So that's a very good idea, and it's interesting. And, of course, you uh, also may mention Elon Musk's other idea that he's not personally developing, which is making the uh, the trains go in evacuated tubes, which can be in these tunnels or above the ground. Mm -hmm. That's right. So if you take and, the air and, out, and, obviously and that's... Just, uh, just interject uh, apologies uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, the boring company. I think one of the reasons he doesn't care about flying cars is because the atmosphere on Mars wouldn't be sufficient to uh, support them. Yes, uh, that's that's quite possibly true, but I uh, I actually don't think that they'll need to do, do tunnels on Mars because, of course, you've got all the land available. But anyway, so his idea, yes, let's make tunnels cheaper, and if we make tunnels cheaper, they definitely would be a better approach than uh, um, than having to put all the cars on the road. Uh, and it would be more pleasant than putting them in the air. But when you fly, of course, you don't need any infrastructure at all. And that's a pretty important thing, too. And, and you know, so you can see where tunnels might be the answer. But once you get away from that very core density, because when you, no matter how cheap you make tunnels, you still have to have a tunnel. It's still an expensive proposition compared to having zero cost of infrastructure, which is the case for a vehicle like these. Now, these vehicles, these flying cars, not everyone is really fond of that term, but no one's got... Uh, the right term yet named because eVTOL is obviously too messy a term. These uh, vehicles have come about because both the small personal drones that we've all been playing with the last 10 years have sort of solved the problem of computer comp controlled gyro stabilized flight uh, with electric rotors. And so that solved people said we can make this bigger so that we can now make vehicles that can take off vertically. These designs that you see here do have a lot of rotors to take off vertically, uh, which is important, but within seconds, really five to six seconds in some cases, a vehicle like the heavy side is already trying to convert to moving the propellers to drive backwards uh, so that it can fly like a regular aircraft with wings, fixed wings. And that is uh, much more energy efficient. In fact, according to uh, Sebastian's calculations and the tests that they've done on this heavy side vehicle, um, they believe they can make it fly more efficiently than drive. So very efficient transportation and goes from anywhere to anywhere, not just where you dug a tunnel. Are, are these uh, electric and self-flying? Uh, so they're certainly electric and they intend them to be self-flying. But everybody is focused first on the engineering problems of just making it fly efficiently and how to be able to manufacture it. And then the funny thing is that while making a self-driving car on the ground is, a, is one of the biggest engineering and software challenges that we have, uh, automating a vehicle in the air has been done long ago, and uh, it's not really that big a deal. Uh, automating the takeoff and landing is a little more work, and of course, building an air traffic control system that can handle really immense numbers of, of, of vehicles sharing the air is uh, a challenge, which is being worked on but not solved. But the actual just automation of flying from place to place is, is you know, almost an afterthought. Uh, so right now, they're testing them uh, without too much automation. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, a nascent um, small airplane industry in the United States was practically killed by widows who could get uh, million-dollar uh, payments even though their drunk husband was at fault killing himself while flying a personal airplane. And that is why today... In practice, we only have the business jets rather than each of us being able to buy um, a, a small plane that doesn't fly itself, that maybe is not electric, maybe it is not hyper-modern, but regulations uh, are such that the, um, the, uh, the responsibility couldn't be spread around uh, with insurance and, and, and whatever else. Well, and, it's, it's not quite as pure as that. I mean, uh, uh, those aircraft, yes, they would be much cheaper if there hadn't been all the liability associated with them. And the uh, companies did stop making them and they changed the law so the companies could come in and make them again. Um, flying is still a very complex thing to learn. It's uh, covered in all sorts of trappings uh, from history and just in terms of there's, you know, it's a lot more training in order to be a good pilot. And also uh, flying from airports 
is inconvenient enough that if I wanted to get to San Francisco, it's quite debatable if I would get there much faster, driving to an airport, getting out a plane, checking it out, taking off, landing at another airport, uh, may, unless it was a seaplane that could land right at the dock, uh, and then getting to a place that I want to go to. Uh, I mean, if the airplane won, it would only be by a tiny amount. On the other hand, if I can drive just a kilometer from my house to a parking lot where I can take off without bothering the neighbors, obviously, uh, you probably don't get to take off from your backyard uh, if your neighbors are bothered by that. And, and one kilometer, maybe you could walk. Uh, well, I mean, yes, like, sorry, I could either ride a robotic taxi or I could walk the kilometer or I could, uh, uh, but, you know, I'm trying to make the absolute fastest trip possible. And that fast trip, oh, I see. I'm, I'm not going to walk the kilometer, uh, but I'll get to somewhere and then I can land again somewhere and then go another kilometer and not necessarily in the plane. Some people are designing the planes so that they have wheels and they can do that kilometer. Some people are saying, well, just an, an Uber would meet you as you landed or a robotic, of course vehicle would meet you as you landed and take you that last kilometer. Uh, suddenly, then you're getting everywhere to everywhere at a super fast speed. Uh, there's no traffic congestion because we have this three-dimensional highway in the sky with uh, really almost arbitrary capacity to handle vehicles. Uh, so that's actually, that's a pretty good picture. Uh, will people tolerate the noise of the takeoffs is an unanswered question. Will people get upset, as you suggested Elon thinks, about the sky being uh, loaded with uh, vehicles? These are questions that people are still working on solving. But in terms of the capability, uh, and of course the ability to do it without needing 40 hours, a minimum of 40 hours of training before you uh, get into the vehicle, uh, the, the, and also about six or $7,000 of cost in that training, uh, that, uh, that would make a big difference. And being electric uh, gives you several really useful things. It gives you one terrible thing, which is the range is still quite limited. But you get this uh, dynamic control. You get a level of safety because these vehicles, with uh, which have eight to twelve rotors on them, um, first of all, electric motors are much, much more reliable than piston motors, uh, so they don't fail. But if they should fail, you've got twelve of them, and you can actually lose a couple and still get down just fine. So you, you, you it, it really is a, a whole new generation of aircraft, and I don't think we could have done what we want to do with the old generation of aircraft. Uh, absolutely. And and both for self-driving cars and for these um, flying taxis, whatever the name is going to be that we agree on, um, do you believe that regulations will be uh, going uh, stepwise as we need them or regulations may hold them back? Um, is so the both, U.S. Both, the best uh, place where regulations are, are being implemented, or are there other places in the world where they are as forward-looking and, and supportive of experimentation as well? So the answer is um, everything to all of those questions. There isn't any one answer. Uh, so let's talk about cars to begin with. So uh, in cars, there's been a fairly lightweight touch uh, in the United States on car regulation, and other countries, like uh, European countries, have had uh, heavier touches from the regulators, and that fits with tradition in the different countries. The um, uh, the Chinese actually were pretty hard on it in the beginning, and then they've done this Chinese ability, of course, to just quickly turn around, which is uh, the occasional advantage of having an autocracy. There are some disadvantages. Let's make sure we remember that. Um, so the history of automotive regulation, though, has been not what people would expect, which is typically when you look at all the technologies in cars around driving, Things like autopilots and uh, cruise controls and anti-lock brakes and airbags and seat belts and all of these safety technologies, they were all just built by industry. They were deployed, sold to customers, in many cases for decades before regulations were written. Uh, and so uh, those regulations, when they were finally written, were more about, okay, this is so good. These anti-lock brakes are so good. Every car has to have an anti-lock brake now. Uh, but they didn't actually try and regulate them while they were being built or deployed or sold tell them how to make them. With self-driving cars, some people want that. They think that the government could make up rules even before the technology is actually selling. Uh, I think that would be a mistake. But people have this, you know, this fear of being killed by robots. We're very funny that way. And uh, because of and that... And they have no problem being killed by people, right? Right. No, no. We're very happily killed by drunks, obviously. Not very happily, but we've bizarrely, uh, you know, tolerated. And as, as we said, we have the 1.3 million people killed every year around the world. More people, uh, you know, I will say that this year it's going to be an unusual year because COVID-19 
um, is going to kill more people than car accidents. That's quite an achievement. More people have died in car accidents in the United States than in every war it's ever had, going back to the American Revolution. So uh, normally this is the big killer, and it's not too hard to be better than it. But anyway, um, the regulators are doing that, and they will regulate more. And as I mentioned, European regulators have been uh, worse about it than American and uh, Asian regulators probably will be ahead of the game. Um, in the air, uh, flying is incredibly regulated already, much more regulated than driving. It's one of the reasons that taking that private plane ship is a, a difficult and a expensive thing that you don't get to do in your own little plane. And uh, fortunately, the flying regulators uh, do want to um, uh, do what they can to facilitate this. And so they've already uh, are working at changing their very complex regulations about what makes a plane airworthy or an aircraft airworthy. Uh, and they're uh, working with the people who are trying to devise new air traffic control systems. So um, by and large, uh, I, I hope that they'll, they'll do a reasonable job. I've lost your sound, David. You've muted yourself. Thank you. What do you think of um, the, uh, the alternative use for SpaceX spaceship rather than doing interplanetary uh, or going to the International Space Station, actually being able to go half an hour the other si <laughs> side of the planet? Um, do we are we gonna see that in your opinion and is that a useful um application of the technology is that going to be a component uh, in in a global transportation system for the 21st century well for the rich perhaps uh by the way just before let's do one more av thing i'm gonna switch what microphone i use and i'm wondering if i'm i'm seeing some latency between my voice and my lips moving at my end okay. I don't, are you are you seeing that uh, the network is uh, misbehaving today. Yeah. Um, I, and um, I let's just deal with that. If I switch to this microphone here, is it better or worse for you? Uh, maybe a little bit better. Okay. Well, we'll go with this instead. Anyway, getting back to um, your question. Uh, you know, people have dreamed about this for a long time the suborbital flight, which can get to anywhere on the planet in 45 minutes. Uh, but right now, the cost of that is just uh, prohibitive. If you could find a different way to launch than using chemical rockets, uh, such as, for example, some people have proposed using linear accelerators to do most of the early acceleration or other such techniques, one could imagine that. And it's possible that for the very wealthy, uh, certainly having taken that flight between Europe and, and San Francisco many, many times, uh, I'd be very happy to see it happen in 40 minutes in, instead of 12 hours. Okay. I'm not, I wouldn't pay, you know, $200,000 a flight. Well, and, and, and you don't believe that the price will go down to compete with uh, what uh, the um, uh, air, um, uh, with, the, with the traditional airlines are charging today? That would be quite a challenge. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but we are talking about uh, uh, right now, just because of the, the, the way that rocket equations work, you just need an immense amount of fuel. Um, to go at that speed. Uh, you, as I say, if you can get another thing besides the rocket to provide most of that velocity, for example, uh, if you can get up to three or 4,000 miles an hour on a linear accelerator or with regular flying engines and then switch to a rocket for a smaller part of it, then it's not out of the question. Obviously, if you get outside the atmosphere, it no longer takes any energy to go from uh, place to place without the air resistance. So that's very big. Um, and I must admit, uh, I'll have to look at their numbers before I can make a, a more serious comment on whether you could have, uh, well, not personal travel, but business travel in, in such a vehicle. Um, a, a friend of mine uh, who was on the show a few days ago coined the uh, neologism coveting uh, in analogy with pivoting that uh, he believes basically everybody uh, will have to 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 apply because uh, whether you are in a startup or an investor or an existing company whose business model needs to adapt mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic even though the crisis may pass will last long enough in terms of how it is changing our behavior our ability to get together uh, for a concert or or even in a in a cinema and things like that that this adaptation is going to be um, in, inevitable in the medium and long term as well, because by the time we have a, 
and well, ability well, sorry, to, what, what to, to get a vaccine and deploy that, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it is going to take time. So do you think that uh, uh, coveting is going to be a necessary uh, adaptive behavior for uh, designing new modes of transportation as well? If, if I am in a, in uh, okay, a small I'm sorry. individual I mean, capsule... I misheard you. Uh, you mean you said coveting, and I thought you said yes. co coveting. No, uh, coveting. C O V I D. Okay, I, I was just going. Well, I never. Uh, um, okay, so um, yeah, that that word's a little hard to uh, understand because it sounds too much like coveting. Um, uh, I actually, a lot of people have been asking me about this, and I even wrote an article about it last week. Uh, I don't actually see. Uh, first of all, I don't see what's happening now as permanent, and I. Uh, I certainly uh, hope it's not, uh, that we will eventually find treatments or vaccines or other techniques to keep uh, vi this virus and other viruses under control. And, um, and then when we do, we'll be able to move back to a, a more normal operation. I do believe, nonetheless, that uh, the public transportation, I believe this long before the virus came, that the public transportation styles that come from the 20th century will become obsolete and will move towards uh, new and better styles, which do in, still involve traveling with others, but not in really large groups like the big train and the big bus uh, that will move towards, um, you know, more like uh, uh, um, uh, vans with 10 to 15 people in them as the rush hour traffic and the non-rush hour traffic will actually be alone without risk of virus exposure to others. Well, with less risk of virus exposure, because obviously... Uh, people are not willing to get into Ubers, not just because they're afraid the driver is infected, but because the guy who was in the car just before you might have coughed his lungs out on the armrest and, uh, are, you know, just not willing to take that risk of being exposed to that. Um, however, I think we'll get past that. But one thing that self-driving cars will actually have as a slight advantage in that department is that uh, because people want to build these self-driving taxis to last for a long time, a uh, typical cars today go about 400,000 kilometers in their life. Elon Musk has said he thinks he can make a car and go one and a half million kilometers in its life uh, with electric powertrains because they are more durable. Um, but if you really were talking about something that could go a million kilometers in its life, uh, you don't want the same interior, that million kilometers. You don't want to be sitting where people have been sitting for a million kilometers. So um, you would design it so that the seats could be uh, efficiently replaced. Uh, er, when they wear out. And that would mean that if there were a pandemic, uh, you would swap the seats out for transit style seats that are easy to clean, you know, that they're not leather or cloth, but something that you can wash with a hose or wipe down um, so that you could keep the vehicle sanitary uh, and that people would not be afraid to get in them in that sort of circumstance. And the truth is, though, that as you've probably noticed as you stepped out on the streets, that uh, it's pretty... Uh, pretty easy to drive right now. There's no traffic. There's plenty of parking. Uh, so people are naturally going to their private cars rather than hiring rides to take them somewhere and or getting on the bus. Uh, and that would be the case again if we had such a lockdown. So we have, uh, of course, zero people buying cars right now. Almost. Yeah, probably. Uh, car, dealer, car dealer must go, oh, my God, a customer. <laughs> I mean, he's not open. Uh, I guess Tesla's right. uh, Tesla. You can order. You buy, you, you buy. I bought my car just on my. Uh, actually, I was in. Uh, I was uh, in Seoul, and I uh, I bought my car uh, just from my hotel room. Uh, and uh, then they they actually it's actually a very fu fun story because uh, Tesla factory is about twenty minute drive away from me, so they delivered the car to my driveway from the factory. They just had an employee drive it to my house, and then the employee got an Uber back to the factory. Rather than having the, there is a dealership that's also like a three minute drive from my house, but they didn't use that. Um, what was fantastic was that the um, as the as the Tesla delivery guy drew up in my new car, which was really exciting. Uh, at, literally at that minute, one of SpaceX's rockets was launching, uh, and we were in our front yard to watch the rocket launch go up, uh, which is also very exciting. So this was all Elon day for us. <laughs> because we said to the delivery guy, hold on, hold on, there's a rocket going up there. And he said, oh, my God, it's a rocket. And the rocket goes up. We watched that. And then we took possession of my new car. Uh, a very different car buying experience than uh, 
I must say I really had. And 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 Tesla uh, allows you to take possession of your car, never meeting actually the delivery person, who will wipe everything off uh, before uh, going away, and then you unlock the car uh, as you 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 go towards it. So oh yeah, that's a, you mean that's a COVID thing they do obviously. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They adapted their their you delivery you wouldn't want features. That. Yeah, I mean, the, in theory, the delivery guy is supposed to, you know, explain a few things about the car for you. And, of course. Uh, that, 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 he didn't actually do that great a job of that. But um, so he could have just left in the driveway and I would have gotten out the next morning and said, oh, look, I have a new car. That's nice. Uh, now, now, uh, the, the reason <laughs> I started By the way, a few years from now, the, the, of course, the Tesla will just deliver itself to your driveway, right? Exactly. If you, if you the, believe the, Elon. The reason I mentioned uh, COVID is because it is the first punch. And then the second punch is um, uh, electrics uh, becoming ever more uh, convenient compared to uh, internal combustion engine. And the third punch is uh, self-driving and the fleets of, of robo-taxis uh, being on a, on a per mile or per kilometer basis ever more inexpensive. Not even mentioning the, the flying taxis if uh, Sebastian is right, then Kitty Hawk uh, can be even cheaper. So are traditional car companies going to be pushed beyond the uh, limits of their adaptability and just give up and go bankrupt? Or are some of them going to be able to embrace this future that for the moment, it really looks like they are just trying to go like la, 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 la and not see it? So some of them indeed will, I think, die in this process. And by the way, if I were to name uh, one of the companies I'd put high on the list, it would have been uh, Fiat Chrysler. Uh, still is, actually, because even though they are selling these vehicles to Waymo, they themselves do not have any technology of their own. Um, however, some car companies, I think, will survive. Uh, this is the, the norm in, in these sorts of games. Uh, some uh, will maybe switch to being what you might call the Foxconn, if you want to use a computer. As many people may know, Apple computer does not make the iPhone uh, physically. They are contract with this Chinese company, Foxconn and Shenzhen, to make the iPhone for them. Apple makes, Shenzhen makes, or um, uh, Foxconn makes 2 or 3% profit, uh, and Apple makes one of the highest profit margins in industry. So it's definitely... Uh, Nice to be Apple in that relationship, but the uh, Foxconn people are not upset with their role. They're, they're a very successful company. So, um, uh, in fact, many people have noticed that uh, this world might be coming, and uh, the heads of Mercedes-Benz, Daimler, and other companies uh, have sort of said, we don't want to be Foxconn, right? We don't want to be just the company that's good at making the physical car and have these software companies like Apple and Waymo and, and uh, Zooks and so on. Uh, have the real value and own the customer. So they will fight that, but they may not get a choice. But that's the reason they all had their own projects, is they didn't want to be in the situation where they were, they were no longer in control of the most important part of the vehicle. Except that they didn't very much believe in their own projects. Maybe they the did not. exception is, is uh, Volkswagen, that after the, the huge scandal of cheating on the uh, yeah. emission uh, tests, uh, really was shell-shocked enough to say, okay, this is an existential crisis. Either we bet honestly on the future of electric vehicles or we are not going to have a future. Well, I said this. It may be the case that they are they bought themselves that future. It, it is funny that that uh, scandal may actually end up being the salvation of the company because it forces them to rethink. In fact, I've had uh, people in other car companies tell me that, that they're saying, I wish this had happened at my company because... Uh, well, these are people who like electric, right? And so they were saying, I want, I've been trying to convince my company to you know, do more electric, and I can't. And now at Volkswagen, they have to because they've been uh, forced into the you know, uh, settlement agreements. And they wished that their company had had to been forced into that box as well. Um, but what's happened actually in the last year is a bit telling, which is to say that most of the car OEMs, not General Motors with Cruz, not Ford, but uh, many of the others, have actually announced pulling back. Uh, and the European companies, in particular the German companies, have been among those who are pulling back on their self-driving development. And this doesn't surprise me because, as you say, 
they never really were that eager about this. They were doing it. Uh, they'd always been interested in it. They'd always had labs on it. But suddenly the newspapers were writing and saying, the future of the car is Google. And they said, that cannot be said. We must not let that be said. We have to lead this. So they put immense amounts of money and immense teams on it. It's a very hard problem. You know, it's still a problem that with 10 years, the very smart people at Waymo are not finished on. And uh, so the fact that they could now say, oh, let's pull back, that was actually comforting to them. They didn't want to see their industry turned upside down at the pace of startups and tech companies. Um, they want to be in charge of turning their industry upside down, and so they'd rather it go at a slow pace. And so investment has slowed. And uh, the fact that these big companies are not uh, buying things from all the startups has also slowed the startup ecosystem a little bit, too. Uh, I think it's a wrong decision on their part. I think that they are, in some cases, sealing their doom. Uh, uh, but that is yet to be seen. So uh, another company that Sebastian Trum founded is uh, Udacity. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, I told uh, you we'd mention Sebastian again today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, Udacity uh, is um, uh, offering uh, courses for people to learn various skills, and one of the skills that uh, uh, that is is being offered is becoming a self-driving car engineer. Um, is there still space if uh, uh, Google takes uh, ten years and they didn't get there and? Uh, Companies uh, with billion-dollar budgets are giving up. Uh, should somebody devote time to uh, try to crack this problem uh, or, or go and... and That's clearly true. Uh, there will not be one winner in this game. That's uh, also important. Uh, but will, will there be uh, 200 winners? No, there will not. Um, and so there's only, you know... Uh, now, some of the teams that people have built have been huge. I mean... Uh, uh, it included the teams doing what's called ADAS, the, all of the other driver assist features that you find in the cars you can buy today. Uh, but they had teams of thousands of people at uh, the German car companies and uh, various other companies. So there were plenty of people, but um, you know, being one of the lead designers. Now, understanding how it works, I think, is still going to be important for even people who are not working directly on it, uh, who are in the periphery. It's always a good thing. These nanodegree programs are not things you spend four years on. So I'm not going to tell people not to take this program, but I would tell people you're not going to become the chief engineer of a self-driving car company after taking that program. And an area we didn't touch uh, where you also have experience is that uh, once we understand that self-driving cars are not simply automobiles without the human inside and the same, same shape and the same function, we free ourselves to design completely novel solutions, such as, for example, the little boxes that can deliver your food and uh, be um, extremely cheap uh, on a per uh, kilometer basis, exactly because they are precisely fit for, for purpose. Yes, I, I, helped I, build, I helped build one of those companies, uh, Starship, which is the leading company in the field. Um, and uh, we have now done 100,000 deliveries, real deliveries of things to people. Uh, sadly, and this is a bit of ironic uh, problem, there's a huge demand for delivery right now, of course, because of uh, the virus. And uh, But Starship dis discovered and decided that it would build its early business in campuses. Uh, turns out to be a great market for this kind of service. And of course, all the campuses are closed. So uh, instead, instead of being a giant boon for the company, it's it's turned out to uh, been a disappointment. That's why we're sad. Uh, but still, it is very interesting, I think. And 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 of course, we wish uh, Starship uh, great success in the in the longer term, regardless of the the current uh, uh, challenges. That uh, these uh, different form factors are experimented with. One of my favorite. Um, visions is that uh, uh, in front of my house uh, there is a, a, a self-driving pickup thingy that is exactly proportional to the mass and the volume of the garbage that I would be discarding and my house negotiates uh, the value of that garbage so that it finances itself just by me living in it. 
Well, okay, that's a bit of a dream. I, I would actually, it's funny, you know, one of the very first um, delivery robots that someone ever built was built, I believe, by a, uh, um, a lab in Italy. Uh, and uh, the reason they built it was that the, in many of the old towns in Italy and other countries like it, the, the streets of the old town are very narrow and you can't have garbage trucks go down and pick up the garbage. And so they said, oh, a robot would be a really uh, good idea for doing that for people. And the second thing that was good about it is, it turns out, by the way, this is not an issue, but at Starship, the most common question people ask of us is, isn't someone going to steal what's in the robot or steal the robot to get what's in the robot? And the reality is that just doesn't happen. Everyone thinks it's going to happen all the time. And we put out, as we say, 100,000 deliveries. We don't have a problem with that. Um, but one thing about a garbage robot is it's very unlikely people are going to want to steal uh, what's That's inside right. that. So uh, they, they, they solved that problem. It didn't need to be solved, but they solved that problem by doing that. Uh, frankly, uh, while it is good to get our, gar our garbage and our recycling out and to have robots do that, um, I'm afraid you haven't picked the juiciest and most valuable part of this technology for your wish. Um, uh, Piaggio uh, is uh, the Italian scooter company uh, behind the Gita. Mm -hmm. uh, which is another concept. Um, I don't know about the availability in the uh, real world. Um, these photos look uh, a little bit uh, designy and artificial still. Yeah. Uh, but uh, these would be those robots that uh, follow you while you go shopping or, or on the beach or wherever. <clears throat> these photos pretend uh, they would be going and and carry your stuff I, I don't want to denigrate people too much but uh it is actually i shouldn't say easy but it's not a grand project to make a basic small robot there are thousands of labs around the world where people can do that and so we have seen uh you know tons scores and scores of companies show up to put this as we've learned at starship that's a big distance between just putting together a basic robot prototype and turning into something that could run reliably on uh, all of those sidewalks and streets and get things to people. Uh, so uh, in that way, not too scared of, of those things, but let a thousand flowers bloom, of course. So um, this has been a wonderful uh, conversation, Brad. Thank you very much. Is the URL I'm showing the best way for people to check out what you write about? And uh, sure, I mean, that's are you a, that's planning to transform all those thousands of words into a book, maybe? Uh, so, yeah, that's the blog site. And then I have a main website, but it's easily linked to from there. So you can find everything from there. Um, you know, I, I've thought about it off and on, although I've wondered about the purpose of books anymore. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, yes, it would be, Nice of me to, at the very least, uh, organize it for the, um, so the blogs, you know, like all blogs, it's, it's daily new things that I'm writing about. Um, and for someone coming into it fresh without having read the things I've written over now uh, close to 15 years of writing about this technology, uh, I will point out with some perverse pride an article from 15 years ago I wrote just telling people that a pandemic was coming where we're all going to have to lock down and we're going to have online classes and video conferencing and uh, uh, online shopping and everything else. So many of the elements of this, I warned people about no one paid any attention, uh, but I, of course, can not feel too bad because Bill Gates also warned about things and nobody paid attention to him. So uh, if he can't get attention, I have to not feel very bad about lacking the same thing, but you're right, so that collecting it all into a more cohesive narrative would be worthwhile. Whether people would want to pick up a physical book and read it is less clear, but it's certainly been on the back of my mind. Uh, during the lockdown, of course, everyone is sort of saying I should really have time to sit down and write my novel, and uh, it turns out that hasn't been the case for most people. And my, my recommendation is for you to do it because uh, then somebody interviewing you can pull up Amazon.com, yes, show yes, the yes. cover of your book, uh, and and then it is a nice way of uh, going as a segue into all kinds of different uh, uh, yes. threads uh, in the conversation. It is also a nice token that you can give out at conferences or have no, the organized no, I, I know fight for, books, for but, all uh, you know, attendees. If you do books, if you get you write books for the money, though, you're making a mistake uh, unless you're Stephen, oh, no, no, no. unless you're Stephen King or something. So I don't charge people to read my writings today. I don't really need the money from it. Um, I mean, Forbes pays me a bit, but uh, that's that's just the way they work. And well, and 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 Cory Doctorow, who is a science fiction author, uh, was um, able uh, to negotiate a fantastic deal with his publisher because the publisher sells his books, 
but they are also available to be downloaded for free from uh, his uh, website. Okay. And 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 I was uh, inspired by him and and was very proud to be able to negotiate the same with my publisher as well. So you can both sell. No, no, I, I, I know the event. And uh, Corey is uh, from my hometown of Toronto, and uh, he worked for us at the EFF for many years. I know him very well. That's right. That's right. So, Brad, thank you very much for being uh, on, on the show. Uh, we um, will ask you potentially to come back if you grace us with your uh, knowledge and, and wisdom around uh, these topics, uh, maybe when something new comes up, uh, even though we will be free and uh, uh, happy to be physically together. I believe that some of the things, the practices that we pick up will stay. And the ability uh, to organize quickly uh, and in a very lean manner, fun mm -hmm. conversations like this is, I hope, one of the things that will stay. Well, it certainly was easier for booking time. Uh, you know, everyone says, so tell me when you're free. I say, well, how about the next month. Uh, it's, uh, however, if I want to write the book, I'll have to not appear on as many uh, video podcasts because <laughs> uh, I have done a, a little bit of that. Um, but uh, yes, the handshake may be replaced by an Asian bow or an elbow bump in the future. Uh, I uh, This is not a joke. It sounds like a joke, but I actually wonder if Italians who, as we know, Italians, when they greet their friends, it's the cheeks, the kisses on the cheek. And I have to say, I fear that that habit may have played a role in uh, the, some of the terrible things that happened in Italy. There is, there is a chart uh, that uh, groups people in kissing on the cheek, uh, or countries actually, kissing on the cheek, uh, uh, shaking hands and bowing, right? Yeah. And the bowing group is far ahead in not getting infected than not the, the other two. And the worst off are the friendliest who are kissing kissing so no, i can't remember i never remember which, which country i'm in is italy a three kiss country or is it a two kiss one country? it's it's just one. Oh, you see that yeah been, just one but uh, be better i think <laughs> i think the French it's too, sloppier than necessary that's true and the spanish though they're also like this so um anyway uh that's one change that may happen although that'd be quite a, a shock to the italian culture for people to be not so friendly when they greet anymore uh so thank you very much for being with us and uh, good to be here too and i'll see you again soon in, in the flesh, perhaps. Absolutely. All right. So thank you very much for uh, uh, following, searching uh, for the question live in this uh, very interesting episode with Brad uh, Templeton, talking about uh, the future of transportation, uh, electric vehicles, self-driving cars, uh, robo-taxi fleets, uh, flying taxis, uh, uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, electric uh, planes uh, and and many other things uh, please uh, feel free to uh, subscribe uh, to uh, our youtube channel uh, and uh, uh, to become a member of our discord community uh, you can go to davidorban.com discord to access the the server there um, also uh, you can suggest future guests as well as vote uh, on the list of uh, existing suggestions uh, in a manner crowdsourcing uh, um, who are the people that I will be in conversation with about uh, the various topics of technology uh, that we like to uh, to cover. Um, and uh, of course, uh, if uh, you believe that uh, this is uh, valuable, uh, I encourage you to um, become a supporter on uh, Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash David Orban. And uh, I thank you and I will see you uh, in the next episode of Searching for the Question Live.